appreciate your being with us in this class and hope that it is accomplishing what we hope all our Bible classes are accomplishing and as well as the devotional talks like we just heard, which was excellent and much needed and fundamental to Christian living. As we closed the class last week, we had looked at the matter of pragmatism and existentialism. We did that because we had started to study false philosophies. And we've used Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 14 as our text where Jesus said, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. The very next verse he says, by the fruit you shall know. So you don't just go by the way things appear, but you look at the fruit it produces in identifying it. And I might say this as we continue on with our study this evening, that it's the person who really doesn't want to consistently follow a rightly divided Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15, who tries to say, well, you're judging me. And yet these verses that we just read to you are designed to give one the wherewithal to make a judgment about somebody as to where they, whether they're teaching the truth or whether they're not. One is not being hateful or unloving because you say to somebody, that's not what the Bible teaches. You may be very sincere in what you're teaching, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Let's look at it and study it for a while. Then it may be that you may say, well, what you're saying is not reasonable. If what you're saying is reasonable, then thus and so. It comes down to something like this. People in trying to justify mechanical instrumental music in the worship, many times will say, well, you can't find anywhere in the New Testament where it's commanded that we not use it. And besides that, they'll say, well, David did. Well, their reasoning is off base, as well as some other things we could note. But as far as David's concerned, you're going to let David be the standard for godly conduct today. David had several wives because David did that what we intend to do. They failed to realize that Jesus said, Matthew 28, 18, that all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then in Colossians 3, 17, whatever we do in word or deed, we're to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, which means by his authority. Well, I don't know where his authority is found if it's not in his word. And Jesus evidently thought that because he said plainly that we will be judged by the very words that are his words. And I know but one place where you can find them, and that's the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the New Testament of the Bible. So when we get into this study, as we have, and we look at some of these false philosophies, or if you prefer false doctrines, then we're seeing some of them here that undergird a great many false views of a great many things. Now, we looked at uh, the matter of, as we closed the class last week, the matter of uh, existentialism. And as we close the class, we pointed out that it's quite clear that the philosophies of both pragmatists and existentialists have produced the idea of relativism. Everything is relative. You can't say that's wrong all the time, and that's not always right uh, when it comes to truth. So they don't like the idea of an absolute objective truth, and they won't have it. So they are subjective people. They like to say, well, that's your view of it, and 
he's got another view of it or she's got another view of it and everybody's different, but that's the way you feel about it. That's okay. Back in the sixties, we heard a lot about the new morality. Uh, I've often wondered why they called it the new morality. It wasn't anything, but what brother John talked about this evening in the devotional talk, Matthew, or rather Galatians five and verse beginning verse 19 in the works of the flesh. That's, that's all it is. It's the works of the flesh morality. And of course, this leads to situation ethics uh, as to the situation determines what's right or wrong. No, 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 you could go. And these things have plagued the world ever since the devil's been able to sell his bill of goods regarding them. They will continue to plague the world. And it's up to us to realize Jesus wants us to see through these things and to see the truth that exposes them for what they are, tools of the devil to lead you away from God. Now, this brings us, as we leave pragmatism and existentialism, we come to one that we've heard more about probably, and that is the false philosophy of atheism. Atheism really is a subdivision of infidelity and is the doctrine that simply there is no God. Of course, an atheist doesn't believe in anything. Philosophy would be metaphysical, that which is not physical, that which cannot be investigated empirically or by the five senses. He or she doesn't believe in anything like that. So they don't believe in angels and they don't believe in uh, man has a spirit and so on. But we want to notice some of the reasons about why we believe in God. Now, you've heard me say this, different ones of you, if you've heard me speak very much about these things over the years, that I want to believe that God does exist. I want to believe that. And I want to believe in his existence because I don't want to be forced to accept the bleak and hopeless alternative. When you rule out God except only material matter, then you lose all hope of an afterlife because you just simply cease to be when you die. With God, that is, believing in God. There's a purpose to life. Without God, there's no meaningful purpose to life, none whatsoever. I listened to a lecture, just part of it today, by Dr. Dawkins, who is the chief pusher of evolution as the way things get where they are. Really what he believed is that all we do is pass on our gene. That, that's all that passes on. And that's all that really changes. And the genes change because the genes that aren't that good don't make it, and the genes that are better do make it, and on and on the fictitious story goes. And it's quite amazing to sit there and listen to him go in all of that. And it's much ado about absolutely nothing. So there's no purpose to life if there's no God. In fact, I don't know why a person who says there is no God Matters eternal and by chance, accident, of no purpose. After billions of years, we finally got to where we are today. Okay? Why are you so concerned about anything then? Just leave me alone. Doesn't make any difference anyway. When I die, 
I'll go out of existence just like you will. So why is an atheist so evangelistic? That's what I can't figure out. And yet these folks are very evangelistic. And they were trying to say, well, we want people to know the truth and to believe in God is not the truth. But why does that concern them? How did those genes banging around form somebody a chance, a chance to where they would be concerned? Where, where did the idea of concern come from? How, how do the genes running into one another, Adam running blindly into one another in somebody's brain, create concern? Or create somebody to care about how somebody else acts or care about what somebody else believes. But they do all the time. But when you believe in God, who created the heavens and the earth and created us, there's a purpose to life. And it's this. The conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. Well, this is the whole duty of man. Well, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. What the writer of Ecclesiastes said sounds right. Now you say, well, that's, that's kind of scary. Well, here's another thing that you need to keep in mind. I want to believe in God because I want there to be complete justice carried out someday. And you know, when people just, are nothing but material and they're here because of an accident. You see all these people killing folks by the thousands and even over history, the millions, brutes. Well, why we call them a brood if we're an atheist? What makes them brutish? Where does that concept come from? Or you see them torturing babies. Why does everybody get upset? All this kind of thing. What difference does it make whether a person gets killed when they're two months old or whether they're 75 years old or we're in between? Why is anybody concerned? We all just cease to exist. What purpose is there? And when murderers operate like they do, that's the reason I call it murder, then how is there any justice? And yet some of the people who cry there is no God, we're not anything but products of evolutions, macroevolution, billions of years, gradual change, and here we are. That's all there is. Well, if that's the case, I don't know why we should get upset about anything. What difference does it make whether we go to war or don't go to war? We just die. In fact, why not have parents saying, well, we've got two children. We didn't intend to have a third one. We're going to go down and have it aborted. What's the big deal? Or maybe you don't like the older one and you got a third one on the way. You just take the older one, teenager anyway, take them off over here and get them done away with. What's the difference? Nothing to it. And you can go on and on and on with that. And the atheist has a terrible time. In fact, he can't do it. And showing that there is truly, which we'll mention again in a little bit, uh, a true source of morals or justice. But, but when you have God bringing all accountable people before him to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, he's an all-knowing, just God who knows every motive you have, every reason you do what you do, knows you better than you know yourself. He's going to bring you to an accounting someday. So none of the wicked people of the world are going to escape. In fact, he tells us, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Of course, we're not saying that we shouldn't strive as godly people to be just people on earth. But after all, we're finite. 
So we can miss things no matter how well we do. God won't miss a thing. He will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Nothing escapes him. Well, of course, that might be one reason some people don't want to believe in God. They don't want to think about giving account of every thought, word, and action to God someday. And how they live on this earth determines whether they'll be in glory with God or be in hell with Satan. See, if you say there's no God, then you rule out any possibility, of, in your mind at least, of the hell that you have to go to. But the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I want to believe in God because with God, society has protection. And without God, society has no protection. By the very reason that even though there's a lot of things need to be corrected in this country and a lot of places in the world, even uh, people who are not Christians, because God has set eternity in their hearts, there is a sense of oughtness there, a moral sense of oughtness. And so we're able to see that laws are enacted that protect the innocent. You ever heard that? Protect the innocent. Now, an atheist has a hard time explaining why he cares about protecting anybody. And I'm not saying about this that an atheist doesn't have morals. I am saying that he just doesn't know how to explain the God here. In fact, it's contradictory to him to say anything about morals. And with God, believing in God, we have a satisfactory explanation of what otherwise would be inexplicable. Now, that's a general statement, but it's applied to a lot of things if you're going to rule God out and try to explain about how it all works. How does the atheist explain why he or she has a sense of oughtness? Since all she is or he is, is matter in motion. There's no God. There's no spirit. He's just an evolved being after a chance. No purpose to it. Evolution. How does he explain that? Why does he, how does he explain even the necessity to be concerned, as I said earlier, how does he explain the idea of discussing anything like that? I'll be concerned. And yet he does. He does all the time. Also, believing in God, we have a better life here. And as I said earlier, a blessed hope with regard to the hereafter. Now, I realize that Christianity is not the only religion in the world that offers something like that, but we're not talking about other religions as to whether they're right or wrong right now. That is, religions that believe in deity of some sort, or deities, plural. But we're talking about atheism. There is no God. And the position that puts that person in to try to explain a great many things when he has ruled out God. Now, I started this in sermon this past Sunday afternoon. That is a study of evolution. Hope to continue it in coming Sunday or so. But I cannot accept the theory of evolution. That's one reason I believe in God, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in this connection, the obvious unquestioned fact is the existence of man. How do we account for the existence of man? There are only two, say that again, only two possibilities. Either one, God created man in his own image, like the inspired Moses said in Genesis. Or number two, man is the accidental product of macroevolution. 
we call that general evolution also. Now, can you come up with a third one? No, you can't. No other possibility has ever been suggested. Therefore, when one rejects the evidence for the existence of God, that person is forced, forced, I say, to accept the theory of evolution. And as I said, we hope to have more to say about that later, even in this study, but especially in the coming times till we finish the matter, at least at this time on Sunday afternoon in the worship period during the sermon. I cannot accept the theory of materialism. I spent a lot of time on that, that either God, the uncaused first cause, the, un, the eternal mind of divine person brought everything into existence deliberately and purposely, or else matter is eternal. And yet there's nothing that says that matter is eternal. When men rule out God, you see all that's left is matter. So how account for the matter? If you would just press this next question, if you want to press it to an atheist, one who believes, must believe, can't get around it in evolution, just ask him then, how did the material, how did matter, non-life, produce the immaterial? How does a rock ever evolve to the point of creating an idea, of thought and the process of thought? of thinking, whether it's logical or not, doesn't make any difference, just of thinking. And how could matter count for one's conscience? How does an atheist deal with his conscience? First of all, why does he have one? And then what is pricking him to say, I feel bad because I did this or didn't do that? How does he come up with, and we've mentioned this already, atheistic values? How does he come up with them? And I mentioned the ability to reason, uh, a moral government. And if you read what the Bible says about the design and purpose of civil government, it's rather obvious that God thought it up, lack of a better way to put it, and brought it into existence because there has to be some sort of order in this world, even among those who don't believe in him, who won't serve him. So there is civil government, Romans chapter 13. I believe in God because for every effect, there is an adequate cause. Now, a lot of times people say, and I know what they mean, for every effect, there's a cause, but to be more particular, it's an adequate cause. An adequate cause. Our marvelous, wonderful universe is an effect. You don't have to ponder, but for a moment, to be just completely overwhelmed when you think of the fathomless space the various planets, the myriads of stars, all of the different solar systems, and then the sun of our solar system and the moon around the world. Now, all of that's moving 
and all of it's functioning according to the very ultimate in mathematical precision. Amazing, isn't it? Does that evidence design or does it evidence confusion? In reality, our Earth is a wonderful spaceship. And we're riding in orbit around the sun on this spaceship at a tremendous speed of 19 miles per second about 68,400 miles per hour. And while it is doing that, at the same time, it rotates upon its axis at the speed of 1,000 miles per hour at the equator. Now, time would fail me to be able to show you all the implications of that. And I wouldn't have the education to be able to mathematically show all of that. But when they fire rockets out into space, even when they go from here to the moon, there is tremendous mathematical precision. And it can be that way because it doesn't change. These laws do not change. Then, as I've said before, I believe in God because there can be no design without a designer. Mentioned that in the sermon this past Sunday afternoon. There's no way a person can sensibly and honestly look at our marvelous universe and not see that it declares design. And what's amazing is that even those who deny the existence of God will talk about the design of it and never see the contradiction in the position they take. There is such tremendous precision that the earth will sustain exactly the same relationship to the sun one year from this moment that it does now. The scientist who examines material things as they are through his five senses, empirical knowledge, simply seeks to discover the particulars of this design. But it was already designed and already there, and the laws governing are there, and how many laws have they not? found, but they're still working because God, by the power of his word, the inspired Hebrews writer tells us, upholds all of that that he brought into creation by his power. The design which relates to this universe then inherently involves law. I'll tell you one of the more interesting studies in the area of philosophy is the philosophy of law. Fundamentally put, law defined is a rule of action. And then when it comes to the working of this universe and our solar system and this world, then there are laws all over the place. Now, the scientist, or anybody else for that matter, doesn't make these laws. Scientist discovers these laws. There's no law without a lawgiver. No picture without a painter. No poem without a poet. And again, no designer without a designer, no design without a designer, no thought without a thinker. You might ponder that for a while. No engineering without an engineer. No chemistry 
without a chemist and no mathematics without a mathematician. Now, because to think that this world is the product of chance then is beyond the absurd. God didn't create it. Then the world is the product of blind chance. Now, as we bring the lesson down to close for tonight, imagine 26, 26 little blocks, each containing on its side a different letter of our alphabet and all the letters of the alphabet. Question, how many times would you have to toss them into there, first of all, to have them come down in proper sequence. Number two, to have them write out a single, short, simple sentence. One who believes that this great and marvelous universe is the product of blind chance could just as easily have us believe and believe himself or herself that Webster's Unabridged Dictionary is the product of an explosion in a print shop or that a timepiece such as a watch is the result of an explosion in a store that had all the parts in it that just came together. When you look at just the human being, inspiration had David declare, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And everything there is about the human body declares that. And the more people study it, the more they see the intricacies of it. So I say again, no wonder the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I want to go on with some of this uh, next time we're together as to why I believe in God. But before we close out tonight's lesson, I want to ask you to bow with me as we go before God in prayer. Our Holy Father, we humbly approach thy throne of glory and grace, knowing that we approach the creator of the universe, creator of ourselves, the Father of our spirits. Before thy great and magnificent throne, we come to laud thy name and to pray that we'll be able to know the truth and the difference in the truth of thy will and in the false doctrines of men. May we be honest in the application of the truth to our lives, and may we bring our lives in subjection to thy will that thy name might be glorified. Guide us on through tonight. Bless us in our efforts to serve thee. Help us to be merciful, giving toward others. We would have thee to be toward us. Please forgive us of our sins as we repent of them and do thy will. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.